So I will welcome Michael Belle, a uh, lean Hi. author and uh, um, a, a warm uh, and uh, writer of uh, lots of lean books, but also articles and columns, the Gemba coach. Welcome. Welcome also to Christina. Christina has been a lean coach for over 10 years at the lean Instituto Lean Management in Barcelona. Uh, had a, has a lot of experience of applying lean in hospitals from the US, but also in Spain. And furthermore, we have Oriol Catracasas, president of Instituto Lean Management, um, uh, also author of several lean books and uh, mostly a uh, lean practitioner, also has done a lot of work in not just healthcare, but also service industry. We have Roberto, our managing editor of Planet Lean. Planet Lean, for those of you not familiar with Planet Lean, that is our the web magazine of the Lean Global Network. And we publish one, two or three articles per week, mostly um, out of uh, uh, the mouths of our the practitioners themselves. So lots of healthcare cases available there. If you go to Planet dash lean.com you find over 70 80 cases on lean in healthcare but also about a total of over 800 articles uh, freely available uh, my name is René Arnouts I'm the director of the lean institute in the Netherlands so a warm welcome uh, Roberto will be our host this evening he will uh, uh, serve as our uh, uh, chair so he will guide us through uh, this hour Roberto, it's up to you. If Thank you, you serve, If you serve as a chair, can, can we sit on you? <laughs> You're not allowed to sit on him. Not tonight. No. Luckily, there is a lockdown and uh, nobody can approach anybody else right now. They can do uh, okay. On one occasion, I'm happy about the lockdown. So, um, welcome everybody. Uh, it's great to have you all here. And um, I would like to start by briefly introducing uh, Planet Lean, uh, Rene has already um, mentioned uh, mentioned it and uh, had some nice words about, um, about it. Um, Planet Lean for the past six years has been focusing on sharing the stories coming from the Lean community around the world. Uh, and as Rene mentioned, uh, the vast majority of them come from the practitioners themselves. So when we talk about the article um, specific to um, COVID-19 and how Lean Healthcare can help tackle this incredible threat that we're, that we're facing. Um, it's important to remember that this article was uh, written by both uh, some of the Lean coaches from the Lean Global Network. We have two of them here, uh, Oriol and Christina, uh, and, but also from practitioners. So some of the authors are people who are running hospitals, uh, specifically one in Brazil, one in Argentina. But we also have other coaches as part of the Lean Healthcare Initiative, uh, also authors of this article, uh, people like Alice Lee from the Lean Enterprise Institute in the US, uh, Denise Bennett, uh, Flavio Battaglia from Brazil. Uh, these are professionals who have been working in Lean Healthcare for a very long time, uh, supporting uh, transformations in the sector, uh, and joining forces with practitioners have produced uh, an article that aims to share some practical advice that hospitals can implement today to help um, uh, really tackle this wave uh, that is uh, sort of like come on to us very quickly uh, and took us all by surprise. Um, specifically, of course, as you can probably tell you know, by reading the news, the wave is starting to slow down in many of our countries, luckily, but there are others where there are there is a two, three, even four week delay in the in the infection. And perhaps those are the, 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 the places that will find that article most useful. Let's remember it was published nearly two weeks ago. So um, Planelina has changed its editorial strategy in the past month or so, uh, focusing entirely on COVID-19. I think most pub publications around the world have been doing that uh, necessarily. Uh, I think it's important that as a community we offer insights uh, on how to uh, fight this threat. Um, I would like to start this webinar by uh, perhaps asking Michael, to, uh, who published a great article for us on Planet Lean a few weeks ago, three weeks ago, I think. Uh, I would like um, him to comment a little bit on why is Lean important in a moment like this? Why is it still relevant when it would seem that everything is doomed? Like, you know, it's, you read the papers, it's all negativity, negativity, negativity. Why is still important to focus on Lean thinking? 
Oh, well, we have a great experience here with we have uh, some CEOs who are lean thinkers and we've been catching their experience all through the crisis. We do um, a webinar over a week and they tell us about how they're facing this problem and what, what lean gives you is a playbook. It's there, you know, the, um, I remember the fireman when Notre Dame was burning, explaining that when you're faced with something like that, you have a moment of what we call in French sideration. You're like a deer in the headlight. It, it's just too enormous for your minds to deal with it. You don't know what to do. If you have a playbook, you can move. You can start acting. And, and the first rule of a crisis is like, don't make it worse. So what the Lean playbook actually turned out to be great for this is like, first is keep people safe. What does it mean concretely to keep people safe? So, okay, concretely, what does it mean? And we started things and it's not, you don't have to wait till you know everything to actually decide and Kaizen. So that's what most people did. We started with the obvious things and they started regular Kaizens and review what they did, keep people safe. Second thing is, and that has been most important for uh, the, the, the CEOs I know who run hospitals is keep ahead of the curve. So we know the crisis is coming in, it will have consequences. When you have a lean understanding of supply chains, you understand that things will fail in, in an avalanche. And the catastrophe is probably not upfront, it's probably in the works because things avalanche. And that's exactly what we've been saying. First, it was masks, uh, very immediately, no, every test, some people could do, some people then, but the hospitals I know, first it was masks, then it was blouses, now it's curar, I don't know how to say it in English, but it's the, the products you need to, to put people to sleep. And, and Lean is, was very useful because we don't necessarily know what to do about it. We saw it coming very early on. So immediately, uh, rather than just wait, we started substitution uh, strategies, talking to local industrials. Uh, what you were describing last time, uh, Oriol, in the, in the previous webinar, you know, you move and you know these things are going to keep coming. You don't know what's going to fail because if we knew that, we could plan for it. But you are very open. You know things will fail. So the moment something looks, you know, iffy, the moment something is wrong, you start moving on this. And I don't want to go on too much, but the third thing where Lean has, is vital in a crisis uh, such as this is this is not a crisis. This is a catastrophe. This is different. This is a shipwreck. We're all on the beach. We're all landed there. And this is a moment where command and control completely fails. This is a moment for two things, coordination, and motivation, understanding emotions, and keeping people going. So again, Lean is very adapted to this because rather than command and control structures, what we can have is sort of Obeya-like coordination structures very quickly, where nobody's trying to direct everything, but people come up with initiatives, get together, and you can help people in trouble. And this means that you bring everybody on board, everybody can participate, and people can see a, a meaning to what's happening. They're, they're, they're participating to the fight. They, they retain some control over the catastrophe, and this keeps us solidly together. So the, these three things, um, keeping people safe and taking care of our customers, because our customers are still here. They have new problems, focusing on the new problems. Second thing is looking at logistics, and the third thing is coordinating rather than commanding and supporting rather than controlling, which are which are inbuilt in lean, are are exactly what you need when when you don't just have a crisis but you have a catastrophe. Thank you, Michael. Uh, one of the things, the first thing you said is um, it's particularly striking to me. You said uh, you know when faced with a crisis, the first thing you try to do is not make you worse. And, you know, when you read the papers, it's actually what's happened in a lot of hospitals where, you know, not knowing exactly what they were doing, uh, they became hotbeds for, for, the, for the spread of the virus and uh, retirement homes as well. This leads me to a question for Oriol and Christina. Uh, how have you, speaking with your community here in, uh, uh, in Catalonia, Barcelona and, and surroundings, where, you know, a lot of hospitals, what are you hearing from them in terms of a response? Like, how have they reacted? And have you been able to see a difference, let's say, between those who were doing lean and are doing lean and are on lean journeys compared to those that are not? 
Well, this, this is a good point because maybe four or five weeks ago when we started to try to write this, this article, uh, we look ourselves, especially Christine and me, so, oh, wh what we're going to say? Because from 10 March, 10 March was the last day that we put a step in a, in a hospital because obviously we, we cannot uh, stay there. So they are doing a lot of things without us. So <laughs> what we can explain? Because uh, maybe people like Fred or people like Javier, uh, which is in the in the article, they, they, they are managing hospitals. So their point of view is, is much better. But on the other side, <laughs> Europe, China, uh, we were some weeks in advance on that. So we are seeing things. And, and it's true this. So well, we're in contact almost every day with some of the hospitals that we are working or we are sharing things. And let's say the most mature hospitals that for many years have been working in, in Lynn, they, they have a substantial difference from the other hospitals that maybe we have been in contact few, we have just friends or just some months. And the main difference was, uh, as uh, Michelle was saying, was the, the panic, was to don't make the things worse. So really, I don't know why, or maybe yes, I don't know. <laughs> the hospitals that were working with Lynn were not in panic. So it seems that everything is, uh, is under control. With absolutely, it was not because the lack of PPAs, the respirators, uh, just in time arriving, how to change completely the hospital, exhausting two shifts every day, night, day, night, day for everybody was there. But when you talk with them, it seems that they are one or two steps before the wave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when you speak with the other hospitals, they were immersed in the wave. They mm -hmm. were panicking, crying. I'm not going to say running without control because uh, mm -hmm. We cannot say that, <laughs> but it was it was a difference. We we can perceive this difference. So we try to to capture this this difference to capture these learnings that we can make from from outside. For people like uh, probably Christina, me, or and probably the the others like uh, Alice, which is excellent, is one of the best uh, being healthcare people that we have in the world. To don't be inside in a hospital, it's it's a pain. But now, as Gomak said, probably is not our moment. So, a lot of hospitals say, "Oh, uh, help me!" But probably we are very good teaching how to swim. But now, what they need is a rescue team, so <laughs> someone that goes in the water. So now, now it's not probably the moment to say move. It's something that you you have to be learn months before years before something like that so now that they can apply a lot of kaizens and, and doctors knows much better about the, the the infection knows much more about what they have to do with respirators with all the healthcare than than me so the, with very good lean mindset these people can make changes much more better and advanced and quick that even i can do because I don't have their their knowledge, the knowledge that they have now, and they they can apply this uh, this now. So really, I hope that uh, we have done something for them, and they can they can apply this. And and this was our, our apportation to the to the article, as well with other people, because also you you can see how Flavio and how Denise two excellent, very, very good link thinkers that they are two weeks after probably on, on the wave that we have here in, in Europe. So you can see how they still can help the hospitals inside the hospitals and how they can apply, how they can prepare that. And it was exciting to see how Flavio and Denise and Alice was helping to, to these people with all these lean tools. And I still remember the very last day talking with Denise to say, okay, today is going to be my last day in the hospital. Tomorrow they are going to lock the, the hospital and how they were preparing everything that I think it's some of the things that it's captured on the on the on the article. 
So there is a, it was a mix of things in, in this article. So I don't know if I answered your question or a different yeah, question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, thank you. Michael, did you want to say something? I saw you were well, raising your hand. Yeah, because my experience as well is even confined talking to people who are doing the work. Um, you know, it, they're like swimmers in a race. And sometimes it's very useful to get them to look up and say where are they, particularly when you're trying to see what's ahead coming around the curve. So I think that these articles that you're publishing and the, all the work we're doing, just talking to people, um, actually really helps. You know, the, there's the pilot that is running the car. He knows how to drive the car, but the co-pilot is really important because the co-pilot says, watch out, this is a curve. It's not what you think. Have you looked at this and have you looked at that? So I think, again, uh, this is not a time for command and control. This is a time for teamwork and 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 looking looking ahead of the curve, looking at things that don't do while they're doing all the work because they, they're working like crazy, man. They're putting incredible hours. And you can see, you know, I get a lot of conversations because they 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 lose the focus and they say, okay, look up, <laughs> take a deep breath. And yes, it's terrible. And, and we have all these emotional blockages from how terrible it is. But still, we need to overcome them and say, what, what's, what's ahead? What's the next step? Thank you, Michael. Um, I would like to move on to some of the more um, concrete things that were shared in the article. Um, and indeed, if we go back to what we what were said around 10 minutes ago, one of the main issues, I think, if we want to keep the hospital safe, is to separate the flows of patients, for like the COVID patient from the non-COVID patients. Um, so maybe, I don't know, Christina or Oriol, again, if you want, can you tell us a little more about how the, 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 the fundamental lean concept of flow can help in a situation like this? And you know, maybe you know, share some examples uh, even fr from, from the article. Hello. So, um, yeah. well, that, that is a very interesting uh, question. So um, that maybe that um, would be our uh, first bullet point in the article. Um, we really were working all together, you know that, and we were not sure about the the correct or order of the bullet points because all of them we find them very important. But finally, we so we decided to start with flow, right? And so I would say that this uh, bullet point it would be the most generic one with maybe less concrete examples, but we mm -hmm. thought it were it was very important to, as you said, Roberto, to start with. Um, separating flows and I think most of the hospitals and healthcare organizations were already doing that of course because otherwise the, the infection would be even worse but in this case uh, we I would say in the first point uh, we are uh, talking about uh, very basic concepts of lean which is demand understanding which is what is your demand and we were thinking about it's uh, interesting for us to talk about that time and getting uh, the people of the hospitals are uh, uh, very fast uh, knowledge about how to calculate it, but then finally we, we thought, okay, maybe it's too complicated, but still we wanted to mention it. So understanding demand, because otherwise you cannot do anything, then uh, when once you understand demand and volume and different types of, even in, inside COVID, let's say, there are different uh, flows inside COVID, which, which the, the, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So first understand the man, then separate flows, which is very important. D depending on the flow, you will uh, dimensionate your resources, material, yeah. areas, number of boxes, number of uh, professionals working. So this is very, very key point. Then uh, another tool we recommend in this uh, is mapping. It's very visually. Uh, we maybe don't talk directly about value stream map, as, as you mm -hmm. said, remember that this article, we want it to be directed to people who already know Lean. But but also uh, to people who That's don't right. know the volume. So we try the vocabulary and the words we use to be the more understandable. So uh, when we talk about flow, as you said, Roberto, we talk about value stream map or visually mapping different lines, also visually, which link to another bullet point and, and so on. And we also mentioned pool, which is a very uh, important concept in order to achieve flow in our processes. Yeah. We, okay, doctors, nurses, professionals, try to be as fast as possible um, discharging patients because otherwise you don't have a bed available but this is also very common sense of course and they are mm -hmm. doing that as far as possible 
but I would say you won't achieve full, if you like more or less this concept or you think, oh, okay, they are doing that already, but the other bullet points are important because if you don't follow the visual, you don't do a short communication cycles, you don't use a standard word, you don't work as in teams and things that make maybe uh, make sound obvious, but it's really not, they do want, you won't be a, able to achieve uh, pull to do pull and flow. So I think it's uh, an introduction point which yep. links to the Northwest. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you raised an important point when you say that one of the goals with this article was to even avoid some of the lean jargon because we thought if this article is going to reach people who don't know about lean, we don't want to like uh, distract them with terms that they might not understand. So we deliberately kept uh, the language very simple and tried to really use more concrete examples that anybody could understand. This leads me to another point. Uh, maybe Renee can, can, can tell us something about that. So we are used to certainly covering lean transformations with the understanding that, of course, lean is a long-term investment and, and, and project. And it could be tempting to, to, to believe that, well, if it's a long-term process, how can he help an organization that might not have a lot of experience with it or might just be starting? Do you think, Renee, that Lean can actually have lead to some very quick results uh, with some of the, the tools and, and ideas that it provides? Yeah, I think we've seen uh, several examples, not just uh, in the countries that uh, are in the article, but uh, also in France, also in the Netherlands. Um, I do think that, as Oriol said, that those hospitals that spent already some years applying lean in the hospitals are, are more quick in adapting to the new situation. Mm -hmm. um, and um, because it's already known, there's less of a hysteria or uh, things are different. Um, Several good examples in uh, Dutch hospitals uh, we know of, like in uh, Leiden, UMC Leiden, where they apply uh, uh, the job instruction uh, very uh, actively. So uh, to train uh, new staff or re uh, staff coming back into uh, uh, healthcare, uh, or in uh, UMC Groningen, where uh, uh, the, fac the, the um, facility, the services, uh, all have used this principle of three to one, one to three. So every employee knows at least three tasks. So when they had to change over from one shift to two shifts, it was done in a minute because they all mul they're all multi skilled. So uh, that was quite a good thing. And that, of course, takes time. So I do think you can achieve good results quickly. Um, but to make it last, yeah, it's an investment. Yeah. At the same time, by now we're forced, like Michael said, it's a catastrophe. So it's, you have to you have to deal with it. And I hope um, at the same time by applying some of these ideas that people see it works. So often uh, a crisis is necessary to make us change our routines. That's right. That's right. Thank you. Um, going back maybe to the to the content of the article, of course, another important point to one of the seven practices that were listed is standard work, which yeah. Renee just, just referenced to now. Um, Chris or, or Oriol, maybe you would like to tell us something about, you know, of course, protocols are important in healthcare, like always, but I guess in a situation like this of extreme emergency, uh, it becomes even more important with a virus that is incredibly contagious and like really sticking to a standard uh, is, is incredibly important. Uh, what is the role that standard work can play in a situation such as this one? Your oh, microphone, Oriol. <laughs> yeah, just to know. It's, it's, it's fundamental as, as usual, but, but here uh, again, if you can see on TV, but also if you have photos from relatives or whatever, now, Every single place is full of uh, standard work in a in a very let's say straight way, very easy way, very visual way, and it's it's done in a, in a help not to tell you what to do, but to remind you 
what to do, okay? Because of you, you, you should know that it's to help you because sometimes when you're in panic, you need someone to, to do that. In fact, in, in some places that you wish to go quick and so, uh, they, they reinforce that. So they put two people to, to help, to point you uh, what to do when you have to unwear the things, okay? So you don't unwear alone. In some places, there are someone saying, okay, remember the glass with the fingers, okay? Things that, that you already know, but they are reinforcing. Because if you make one mistake in one of these steps, okay, maybe uh, a whole thing is on compromise. Not only your healthcare, but some things in, in compromise. So how can to make it easy? How to ensure that you can follow that, that it's helping for you? Even if it's three, four weeks working on that two sheets, there is someone that is reminding you how to do the, these things. And then to make it, to make it easy, so if you have things in two places, you can make a mistake, put it in one place. So it seems that uh, the standard work or the good standard work have in mind uh, also all the Jidoka concepts, all, all these things are, are embedded. And for me, it's nice to see this, nice to see this place. And holding and inventing new standards for new problems. So it's not just solving the problem, but creating a standard to solve the problems. I remember one that I think that uh, that uh, it was uh, you, Christina, that saw about the cards for the people that uh, have to keep their job because of a positive. I don't know we want to introduce, but I think it's a good example. Yes, please. Oh, we can't hear you. Christina. We can't hear you. Microphone. So, yeah. Yeah. So, is this yeah. the example number two of the article of the third bullet point? And it, it, it would be uh, referring to leader standard work, which is something we also highlight in this uh, point. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. professionals need to have a standard, but also leaders that are in the, the responsible area, let's say. Yeah. And so, in this case, um, yeah. It was very funny, this one, I like it a lot because it's standard work, but it's also about visual things. They create like a Kanban, which is like the, the card you you use, you, you wear the card and it says your name and the area where you work. So the problem these days, as you already know, is that there are a lot of professionals infected that they have to go home very fast. So. A, if you are in a big hospital in the human resources department in, in this area, you can get crazy knowing in different areas with who, who is going, with who is coming. And so they decided to do it visual, so simple. So this card is a, is, has a color. And when you have to leave, of course, you tell to your supervisor. But in, um, besides that, you leave the car in a in a folder or wherever and so the human resources area know very fast uh, the one who's missing and so they are uh, that's right that's right that's right to that's right and to, to replace anything and that's been a, a very big and that's been a very big puzzle for professionals for professionals in Spain and in the world in Spain and in the world uh infections among healthcare professionals so i mean that should also be i guess a priority and uh being able to identify uh people quickly who might have been exposed of course is fundamental so that, that you're right that was a, that was a great example but in the article uh another thing that i wanted to ask you sorry what did you say no it, this in this word point very fast i would like also to add to what Oriol said is that um as like, for example, visual management, everyone understands it and, I don't know, separating flows and all this. With the standard work, we mentioned working with teams and di dividing by areas and not doing a, a big spaghetti because I, I am putting very, a lot of passions at the same time. And this is crucial that uh, that is uh, something we highlight, that they work yeah. as, a, as teams. Because many times they, they don't see the necessity to do that. But it's, it's very, very important to create small teams so they work in a specific area with specific patients 
and, and that's so now the communication is fast, is more reliable. And this is, I think, for our experience, is something that people don't don't see. I don't. Uh, that's my opinion. Uh, and I repeat, when you talk about visual, every everyone agrees about uh, yeah, visual things. But, but when we talk about standard work rating things, organizing differently, uh, a little bit differently, I think it's it's important. Yes. So. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We have a we have a bigger issue as well, and this is something in in one of the hospitals we're starting to think about, is that um, if we if we look up from the hospital itself, we're all going to come back to work, <laughs> hopefully, eventually, to um, very new hygiene rules and very stringent hygiene rules. And so far, I don't know what is in your countries, but nobody has been trained and nobody is even looking into it. Uh, so I think this is where 5S comes really into it. Uh, so we're back in the command and control world of here are the new rules, so 1.5 yeah, meters and one person per desk and wash your hands. And so suddenly we have these new rules. For healthcare professionals, this is their life. They they live with transmission, infection, and disinfection, so they understand. And for them, it's just a step up. It's not convenient, but it's something they perfectly understand, and we have to do it more because we understand the virus is particularly contagious as opposed to some others. For the rest of the population, this is going to be completely incomprehensible. So I think what is going to happen is people are going to try to put the rules in place. What's going to happen is like wash your hands. People are going to go around the rules and not do them and whatever. So I think there is another big thing we should do, which is start a massive coordinated push on 5S to lead people to hygiene practices. We're going to have to change the hygiene practices in our countries, some countries it's going to, for instance, the countries that already have very um, experienced hygiene practices like Japan and South Korea have been less affected, or Germany to some extent, have been less affected because they're already cleaner and people already know things about not putting their shoes in the house. Um, in, in other countries, this is going to be very new. If we impose it, people are just going to fight back. So there's nothing being done at the moment to train, to explain, and to make it work locally, which is exactly the purpose of 5S. This is what we do in every factory when we start. We 5S, as you said, Christina, uh, unit by unit, team by team, so that each team locally finds a way to solve the problem it poses locally. And and I think, um, I think we have a job to do to start explaining to people out there that imposing the rules, you can do that, but that doesn't mean people will follow them. People need to understand and own these rules to to start following them, and and this is where uh, some techniques like 5S are really useful. But I think even in healthcare, it's uh, quite dif difficult. Um, a couple of years ago, I learned that an average uh, nurse uh, touches uh, makes 700 changes per day between touching something and a patient. So. Uh, and the idea was that you have to wash your hands each time. So that means 700 times a day, uh, which is tough to do. Clearly, clearly, yeah. And in the Netherlands, I think already about 38 to 40 percent of the patients uh, are healthcare people. Right. So we now see a massive uh, uh, thing happening that the focus is now more and more going to elderly homes. Same goes for Singapore. Spoke to a Singaporean friend last Saturday where they increased the countermeasures again because so many people died in elderly care homes. So I think the focus has been on hospitals, but we rapidly see uh, more and more uh, people uh, uh, in elderly uh, homes and not just the uh, residents, but also the personnel okay. because there's a lack of PPEs in uh, the secondary, uh, let's say the secondary uh, outside the hospitals uh, organizations. Thank you, Renee. That's that's actually a very good point. Uh, uh, 
Oh, okay. Uh, the the personal protective equipment has been uh, personal protective equipment pretty much around the world. Like we've world. Hearing, like, certainly heard it in Italy, where I'm from. Uh, we've heard it here in Spain. We've heard it pretty much everywhere. And you know, with replenishment systems like uh, Kanban, but not even just that, but even just the the idea of rationalizing the use of resources that Lean teaches us there are bound to be many lessons that hospitals can learn about making the most of what they have, let's say. So I was wondering if any of you would like to maybe reflect a little bit on that. And uh, we've seen examples, and some of them I think are in the article as well, uh, of how yeah, even just like organizing the number of interactions with, uh, with patients to limit them to the, the, bare, the, the necessary and no one more, so that you don't have to, you know, take off the, the 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 robes and the masks and everything and then kind of chuck them and then wear new ones right after so would anybody like to share some thoughts on uh, on ppe and how i guess yeah, I think more... for you all uh, you had a good example uh, of this hospital in uh, barcelona where they uh, set up their own production line yeah i think also linking with what michelle was saying at the very beginning the difference and how they make this disguises. Uh, probably uh, most of the people are fighting for the solution. As you say, solution is PPAs. I need my PPAs. Why these PPAs didn't arrive yet? I ordered these PPAs. I need to order again, and they are stuck with the solution because, of course, it's a good solution as for PPAs. But they don't. They fight with the solution. They don't fight with the problem. Okay, which is the problem? The problem is that we don't have PPAs. Okay, so try to understand why, okay, and try to find a different solution. If you stick with the solution, this is not lean. Going to the problem, understanding the problem, this is. They understood at the very beginning, PPAs is not going to arrive in the way that they think. So they created a factory. So they, they live in, the, in a county and with uh, some companies in the county that they help it. But it was not enough. So they, they felt that to be quick and, and they need to lead that. So they are leading this factory. Okay, they, they call it factory. It's not a, a factory itself because they cannot be together, but they call it factory. It's a, a factory project where they, they create, they manufacture some of these PPIs, okay, even homologated and, and everything. And they are working in, in pool and they are being so successful that they are not only serving the hospital itself. They are serving the, the complete county. They are serving the police. They are serving uh, other doctors from the primary. They are serving even the pharmacy, even the baker. So they, they are serving all the county with the effort that they did that. So, okay, yes, you are right. Ask for the PPAs, ask for the PPAs, ask for the PPAs, but don't fight for the solution. Go, go, to, the, go to the problem. And they are doing that. And related with the real question that you did about just in time, okay. Uh, in fact, uh, Shigo Shingo, we said last time, in the 80s, they said that probably we make a mistake with just in time. So we should, we should call it just at time, when we need it. It's not yeah. delivering in time, it's, it's making at the right time, at the right place, at the right quantity. Otherwise, mm, what <laughs> and when and, and, and which? And this is in, in, interesting. So if you can be flexible enough, but this is lean, to produce what you need when you need, and this is just in time, then you can solve all the problems. Otherwise, it's like playing lottery. Yes, I will wish to buy a number <laughs> the yesterday that is today lucky number, but uh, the, the big... I prefer to, to have a, a machine that creates the money yeah, instead. The big scandal that we saw in France is that they, 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 were, they, mis they didn't have masks, but there are masks everywhere. There are masks and inventories of people who are thinking uh, wartime rationing, so they are keeping the masks for later. And you're saying, yeah. but later, there's no later. If 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 caregivers fall ill now, I mean, there is no later. 
the masks are needed yeah. now. Now, the interesting thing, which is very lean, is to realize that if you deliver masks that you have now as, as the tag time that is required, this puts immediate pressure to actually find substitution or to get out the masks and to do something. If you are looking at your pile of masks and you are rationing them, it gives you the false impression that you have still some weeks ahead before you do something. So really, in the French response uh, at government level, what, we, what has been uh, both tragic and, 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 and fascinating to see is that everybody's been thinking stocks. They've been measuring stocks. I have more stocks than you. We don't need stocks. We need to use them, but they don't want to use them because then they lose our stocks. But that's the point, you know. And and what nobody understands, which is we need to explain with Lean, is that delays the response, and everything is so slow to say yes, to give uh, new accreditations, to give new homologations. To uh, we've been fighting in France now in the Lean community for there's a technique that is accepted in the states for sterilization of masks and reuse of masks. It's accepted in many places in the world. We still cannot get approval here. It's mm. been a big, big fight, and it, it's just they will eventually give approval. It's just they don't see the urgency. So I think again that uh, as a lean, uh, if we could convince the world to think in terms of flow, as you have said, uh, rather than things of stocks, people need to understand that this triggers a different kind of action, as you described, because you can, if you see anything in flow, well, you can see exactly how long your stock is going to last, mm -hmm. and you realize you need to do something now, not in two weeks when when the stock is not there anymore. So I think this is a very big point, and the, the examples you have are great because they show that. Thank you, Michael. Um, just to give everybody, everybody an update, so we have about 15 minutes left. I would like to leave some time at the end for questions because we're getting uh, a lot of them and some of them are really good. Um, before we move on to that, I would like to, maybe for the next six minutes or so, uh, to maybe devote the next three minutes. <laughs> I would like, as I interviewed a free hospital just today. Two minutes. Today. Two minutes, yeah. Two, two, two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, and they were, all of the free hospitals that I talked to today, they were really highlighting the importance of the daily huddles and the idea of like bringing everybody together, um, which sounds obvious enough, but apparently, uh, you know, common sense is not that common otherwise, uh, you know. So I would like to ask um, anyone who would like to, to, to pitch in, uh, in, into this conversation, what is the role of communication in general and, you know, things like daily huddles, visual management, what what can we learn, perhaps even from some of the examples, and, and if it's so obvious, why doesn't it happen more often, even though in Lean Hospitals it's the... It's the we staff. need to understand the difference between command and coordination. It's as basic as that. In a crisis, it's counterintuitive. We have images from cinema and so forth that the leader takes charge and directs everybody. You do this, you do that. I've been a sailing skipper, I've been in a crisis, uh, read team of teams from a crystal uh, as a general. This is not true. In a real crisis with real people in a really difficult situation, what wins the day is coordination. This is what huddles do, obeyers do, all these techniques do. and and. It's, but, but we need to really explain to people that will you stop with the take charge and take decision and make sure that this is what the Churchill's war rooms are about and coordinate the initiatives. Thank you. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. I would also add, you know, I would also add that um, these days they are all of the people we have talked uh, with. They say that they are adapting and changing standards, visual signs very fast, very fast. So I would highlight that the importance of uh, doing that these huddles or this uh, creating these communication and coordination panels or whatever uh, uh, allows people now in the hospitals to make a difference between firefighting, they say they are problem solvers, they are proud of me, and we ask, but you, what are you doing, trial and error, or are you doing Kaizen, really? I don't know if I explain myself. 
So I would say yeah. it's very important because even though they have to go very fast, very fast, very fast, and it's impossible to work like this, if they do the hurdles, among other things, they will achieve to the next step, they, the next thing they try to be think, uh, very um, reflectionate, uh, that they can think about that. So probably they will be Kaizen, not only just try because, and I think this is very, very important because the, this crisis after the summer, it will come again. Some people say, we don't know. Yep. So it's not about yep. only now and finishing in the summer. So I think it's, it's important. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. One final uh, thing before we move, we, we move on to the questions that I would like to ask everyone. Like to ask everyone. Um, not just necessarily tied to healthcare, but like in my experience, uh, talking to a lot of people who are on a lean journey, is some of the best stories that I've come across always came from a situation of a burning platform or a crisis or some kind of an emergency. So if we want to be optimistic and positive about the situation that we're going through right now, which has very little uh, positive in it. Um, how do we make it a source of learning? And what is the role of us lean community to ensure that that happens? And uh, I, I, th I think we have a lot to, to show the world as a community. And I also think that there is an opportunity because this is a huge crisis and a lot of organizations will need to find a way to either reinvent themselves or make sure that a very bad economic situation can be turned around, what, what have you. So what, what do you think the future has, might have in store for us and what should the contribution of the Lean community be? Well, uh, adding to what Christina said before, just a, a moment, uh, it, it's very important to, to coordinate, but also with confidence. And, and this, this is a little frustration also. When we write this article and I was reading it, say, most of these things is common sense. So how we are going to call it lean? And in fact, when you, a lot of people who read that say, ah, in my hospital, we are not lean, but we are doing almost all these things. Yes, it's true. But this is the difference that the, the swimmer that was saying, um, Michel Valet or, or the pilot, okay, if you ask for a swimmer, what are you going to? Yes, there to the goal. Okay, but how often do you see the goal? No, I'm swimming. I don't have time to see the goal. Obviously, we are going to the goal, but you have to remind the swimmer to look at the goal because eventually you, you, are, you are directing, it's, it's natural. So yes, uh, how I'm going to write in an article that you have to go to the goal, to a swimmer? It's, it seems stupid, it seems obvious, but mm -hmm. how often you do that? And when you do that? And the answer is, I don't have time, I have to swim. And this is the difference. So everything that is writing, it's common sense. So I, I'm sometimes I'm panicking writing this because it's common sense. But how I'm going to write this? It's obvious <laughs> that, that they can they cannot do nothing uh, different from from this. But how they are doing priorities is lean. The way they are, they are doing like the way that you are stocking, piling, using all all these things. And here it was very nice. I, I remember when Christina also showed me. Look, Monse, in one of the big hospitals in Barcelona, one of the leading nurses created the panel for the huddle. So they know that they have to huddle. They know that. But how to do that? Not easy, because you're seeming. So you need someone, a coach, in this case was an internal coach, uh, one of the nurses that created the model for the huddles for the complete general hospital. It, it was impressive. Because with this huddle, now they have confidence to do that. It's not about just making the huddle, but how to do that? What, what have to be that? And have to be very, very, very simple. Otherwise, you are not going to do that. And also, probably communication on how you are doing this. This is one of the main differences also with Lean and non Lean, because the, the, the big, the, the first answer to a crisis for not only hospitals, governments, whatever, it's to centralize. Okay? Because it seems that you, if you have the answer on control, you have the problem on control. It's not true. This may be true for companies, organizations that are solution-minded, not problem, not real problem solvers. And this happens. And a lot of companies try to centralize the control, the information, the answer, 
and it creates a, a very slow answer, not the right answer, because every place, every flow have different things. This is why that these little huddles in these little teams, but with coordination and confidence, because otherwise it seems okay, do whatever you want, and this is not the message, okay? It's it's is working. Okay, and then the, the other one also. <laughs> uh, so I, I know that you have to do it short and you warn me, but no. No, okay. no, it's okay. okay. <laughs> I will just mute you, Oriol. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I tried. And the second thing, another one of the leading uh, people in another of the hospitals, Anna was, was saying to me, Oriol, it's amazing. A lot of the things that we are doing now is going to be here forever. A lot of the things like the health in virtual or remove some of the tests and go to the point, use the good doctors as the front door. And so there is a lot of things that we refuse it to do. And now we are doing. And it's going to stay forever. Sometimes, as you said, we need a crisis to do changes. And some of the, uh, I remember Gemma, one of the emergency department, uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, finish, they finish this. Uh, they, they say, the doctors are telling me, we are the break and we are the accelerator. Sometimes we see the CEOs, we, we look on to the top managers, but really we, the professionals, we are the accelerators and the brakes on all these changes. And it's absurd. Thank you. Actually, this links to one of the questions that we got that says, oh, we're sure that we're going to face a tsunami of patients with delayed care combined with the 1.5 meter social distances, the flow of patients need to be more limited. Do you see already hospitals who are redesigning care? So I guess this is linked to it somehow because I mean, some of the improvements that have been put in place, I guess they might well end up you know, staying in place uh, if they turn out to be a better way of, of, uh, of organizing and, and providing care. Does anybody else have any thought about that? Well, we're, we're clearly pushing a sand heap. Uh, I don't know what happened in your your country's hospital. The hospitals I know here, what's happened is that um, they've put so much effort into COVID services that they've they've stopped a lot of other things, and and um, people are scared to go to hospitals. But we still have, sadly, we still have cancers. We still have our conditions. We still have all the other treatments, and so we've been pushing this sandhip of treatment in front of us. And, and at some point, it's good, we're going to have to face it. And uh, the so the real issue is flexibility. One of the misconceptions that the media shows is that when you open your web, your your media, your front page, newspaper front page, you have the the worst news from the entire world in one page. So it looks like the world is ending. But when you have more of a Gemba approach, you realize that to some people the world is ending, but let's say for three days. And then you talk to them three days later and say, no, we're fine. And then a week later, they, again, they're crashing. So it, it and it's, it's completely depends where. So the real issue we have is flexibility. And I get back to the coordination and absolutely the, the serenity, the serenity of understanding what we do is the confidence that we will be helped that when we are crashing, people can move around and will help us. And of course, the way hospitals have been designed is to be very rigid with specialties and bureaucracy and procedures. So I think one of the big problems that we're facing very concretely now is um, how do we get this flexibility to put the resources where they're needed now, as opposed to plan for resources for the next six months when something completely different is going to happen. Thank yeah, you. we see some hospitals really going back to uh, normal uh, services. So yes, we dealt with the biggest uh, COVID-19 part, but we need to revamp uh, all the other services as well. Mm -hmm. Or like in Russia, where they have focused uh, hospitals. So specific hospitals are just focusing on COVID-19, so other hospitals can continue the normal services. Thank you. Uh, one Perfect. other question. Yeah, one other question that we got is, is quite specific, but it would be interesting perhaps to see if there is anything that we can do to uh, help this person. Um, where is it? I'm sorry. Yes, so it was talking about, do you have any ideas uh, 
on how to help people who work uh, with the homeless who can uh, to protect themselves better essentially you know people like working in nice shelters where space is scarce and people are not used to hygiene on a very regular basis this goes back to what you were talking about michael right there is no sort of like education on on hygiene uh, measures and um, is there anything that we can we can say to to this person to help them uh, sort of figure out when the space is scarce. I realize that without having an idea of a space, it, it might be difficult, but like, are there some general kind of rules of thumb that can be used? So I think we can, here we can use job instruction. So major steps, key points, reasons why. And Michael made a short video on 5S for san sanitation. Um, so very simply explaining uh, things and training people in a very short way how to do this. Uh, I think there's also some examples of uh, hospitals, but also uh, big uh, cruise ships where they now, uh, they opened up for to homeless people. So they have more privacy. So one person per room, instead of in the um, normal situation where they all are in large halls with 40 people in a, in a, in a sleeping room. So uh, two things, uh, um, job instruction, 5S uh, for hygiene, and also uh, um, thinking of relocating these people from the streets to other than the traditional areas where people could sleep. That would be my uh, yeah. Thank you. take. Uh, there is another question very quickly. It's related specifically to the articles and asks, what would you suggest um, in terms of sharing the essentials from the article with professionals who are not lean experts? I mean, as the person who helped the team sort of craft the article, I would say that the initial idea was to be able, no, the idea was to have information that would be easily shareable with people who don't necessarily understand lots about lean. So it doesn't, you will not see, it will be very light in terms of uh, lean jargon. And the, the, the concepts are explained in sort of plain language. And I would also add that like the examples that are there are, are incredibly visual and um, I guess if anybody wants to add something about it, because they're all coming straight from hospitals, I would uh, I would assume that people in healthcare organizations around the world will be able to read those charts and those examples and even those pictures. Does anybody want to add anything about that? Christina? I think she's agreed. Sunny, <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, Great. Okay. I think I think we okay. are. We, we, we got are. to the end of the time that we have. There were a few more questions. I will make a note of them and see if I can uh, reach out to perhaps the people. And uh, uh, if not, you can send me any, well, let's do that. Why don't you send me an email and I'll try to maybe even cover it in a future article on Planet Lean. So if you want, you can email me at editor at planet-lean.com and I will be getting your questions there. Sorry if we didn't have the time to answer them all. Uh, but thank you everybody for for joining. Thank you, Oriol, Michael, uh, Rene, Christina. Thank you, Rene, for organizing this. And I hope everybody enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you all. Thank participants. Thank you. Hope you uh, stay got safe. Stay ideas. safe. Stay safe and stay sane because uh, I don't know who is okay. in confinement, but that, <laughs> that, that is uh, for it's, it's, it's starting to get long. So stay safe and stay sane. And thanks for all the writers in the article because. Absolutely, yes. Doing has been a very good experience as well. Absolutely. It's actually been wonderful seeing you guys work together. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been great. So thank you very much again to all the authors. It's, it, I'm amazed at the energy that is in healthcare. And I'm amazed at the, the care in healthcare and that the number of people who really show up when they need to. And, and the fact that there are still reserves of compassion for the patient, because one of the things I see is that everybody's so busy saving ourselves um we have so little time for the people who are ill but really if we're thinking lean this is where it starts how do we keep them safe and how do we make sure they return to their lives as fast as possible so um i'm always uh, very optimistic uh, I just want to finish on this. Is what I hear from hospitals is really interesting. We know what hospitals are really like in real life, the politics and everything, and absenteeism and issues. And and what I hear is that in the COVID sector, is none of this happens. But the moment you return to normal life, you're back to that. 
So uh, it's 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 interesting because I, it, it fills me with optimism that means that when there really is a problem, people rise rise to the rise to the situation, to the occasion, and yeah. and that's what we've seen in healthcare. And I think it's been wonderful. And and I, I want to thank all the professionals there because uh, they've really done something amazing. Thank you. Hey, thanks all the participants. Hope you enjoyed yourself. Um, and uh, again, if you want to hear more about us, uh, register for the newsletter at Planet Lean uh, or at the Instituto Lean Management or Lean Institute. We're happy to help you. Hope to see you again. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye.